Yeah. I don't even know how to start these things. I have just like, wait a second. Uh, we need to like come up with a like, oh, hi, I'm Adrian Fonseca. And you're the tech guy here. You're the one who inter- interviews everybody and their mom. Everyone <laughs> and their mom. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah, I was like, okay, so we need like to like, oh, welcome to <laughs> and uh, have a little intro kind of thing. Um, or like the church militant mic'd up. We interrupt <laughs> this program to bring you the special news broadcast. Uh, maybe not like that. <laughs> <laughs> we interrupt this program. <laughs> to bring you a special news broadcast. Yeah, I don't know if we can qualify what we're doing as news. <laughs> not, not news. <laughs> okay, so uh, today I think we wanted to talk about um, why tradition appeals to the youth. Um, Which we are. It, yeah, exactly. So I'm 21 and you're... 23. There you go. So we're pretty young and I just turned 21 literally a month ago. Um, and I turned 21 two and a half years ago. Actually, I turned 21 literally a month ago. It, my birthday was March 5th. So wow. nice. Yeah. Happy birthday yeah. in a month. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I think we wanted to uh, share with our uh, friends over here um, what our faith experience is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sarcasm again. And so um, if would you like to tell, um, you want to talk about your faith journey a little <laughs> bit? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So today, uh, like, like Adrian said, we're talking about why tradition appeals to the youth again, which we are youth. Um, and just to share a little bit of my experience. Uh, so I, I have a degree in music and uh, my first, my first experience, uh, with tradition came within the context of music. So my, my choral professor, um, in college was a, high church Anglican. If you don't know what that means, um, there are some Anglicans who, uh, beginning with like blessed John Henry Newman in the 1800s, when the Anglican church started to become more Catholic in liturgy and in, in uh, flavor um, because they saw compatibility between like the the doctrines of the council of Trent and um, Anglicanism. So it started to become more, Anglican, a Catholic in flavor. So the result is that today you have many Anglicans who think they're Catholic, but of course they don't accept the Pope. So we know that they're not. But um, nevertheless, uh, you you can find many good people in that brand of Anglicanism. And so my my professor, as I was saying, was is a high church Anglican, and uh, I was given the opportunity. Uh, before I even began college, when I had already auditioned um, and, and been accepted to the music school, I was given the opportunity to uh, sing in his his church choir, who is which is one of the best church choirs in 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 all of town. Um, and we were doing an even song, which is uh, the Anglican version of vespers. So it's vespers plus compline smashed together. So you'll have a magnificat and a Nunc Dimittis, the Canticle of Mary and the Canticle of Simeon, um, as well as psalms, readings, um, an anthem, a couple of hymns. Um, it's an ancient, not ancient, but it's, you know, 400, 500 years old. It's a beautiful tradition. But uh, at the end, any of you who play, pray the Liturgy of the Hours will know that at the end of the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis and the psalms, you pray, you say, the glory be to the Father, the glory of Patri. Um, and so I remember thinking, but I had never been exposed to the liturgy of the hours before. I remember thinking when we got to that part in the particular setting of the Magnificat that we were singing, I thought, hold on, glory be to the father. Catholics, we say this, don't we? And of course the answer is yes. And I just remember thinking this, this music is so dignified and so beautiful and they've set, they've set uh, the words of Mary, the mother of God, who we believe to be, as Catholics, we believe to be immaculately conceived, uh, you know, forever virgin, um, and, and the Theotokos, the God-bearer, um, they've set these words to such beautiful music, and they don't even believe the same things about her. I was so scandalized, and I thought, you know, I grew up with all kinds of just happy-clappy, 
hippy dippy stuff. Wait, so you're saying that it's not dignified for the mother of God to sing Hell Holy Queen above <laughs> Enthroned above. Oh Marie. That's a good hymn if it's not done like Sister Act. Um, <laughs> no. Um, no, if it's not done like Sister Act. We can all start clapping and uh, have all the sisters <laughs> come out and start dancing down the aisles. And why don't they dress up as priests while they're at it? <laughs> um but I was really scandalized, and I thought, these people don't even believe the same thing about Mary as, as Catholics do, and yet they do a much better job of, of honoring her. Um, and you'll find this also. I had, I had the opportunity to sing for a Sunday service at this particular church. You'll find this also in, in uh, the Eucharist. They, their, their music and their liturgy often reflects a more accurate Eucharistic theology than than uh, what you find in a lot of Catholic churches. For example, they sang, one time I think I sang uh, William Byrd's setting of the Ave Verum Corpus, which is, Byrd was a Catholic. Yes, he was English, but he was a Catholic. And I thought, man, these people are singing our music. I was so scandalized. Yeah, where's our patrimony at? Our patrimony was uh, flushed down the toilet after Vatican II. Um, but it... it so that was my first real run-in with tradition, and it led me to explore more more traditional Catholic music uh, because I knew that these composers were Catholic. Um, then led me to Gregorian chant. I was able to sing in the, the Gregorian chant scola in college, um, and it led me to eventually, I think in my junior year, attend my first traditional Latin mass, and it was all downhill from there. Mm, wow. Um, so a quick question. Um, and so now that you are where you're at, mm -hmm. uh, how often do you actually attend the, uh, Trinity mass? Uh, I tend to, I attend it, um, on average, at least I'd say twice a month. Yeah. So, um, you mostly attend what the Novus Ordo and, so uh, I, I, uh, I work at a parish that is part of the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter as a musician. Um, and so that's where I'm at on Sundays. Um, so, and if you don't know about them, you should definitely check out their liturgy. It's very beautiful, uh, very close to the traditional mass. Um, but uh, then I attend my uh, Novus Ordo parish um, for daily mass, you know, at least two days a week. Yeah. So that's the other thing I noticed. Um, most traditional Catholics mm -hmm. will also attend a Novus Ordo mass and not have a problem with it. Um, but the opposite well, is not usually true. I mean, we do have problems. Well, with right. It. Problems with it, but not like, like, oh my gosh, Novus Ordo Mass right, is exactly. not a real Mass. But the opposite, like you said, the right. opposite is not necessarily true. It's so um, violent in the other direction. Yes, uh, exactly. You, which we'll talk about later. People who love tradition also, the, because they realize that the, the that the church is, um, what's the word, in, in uh, indefectible, um, that it cannot stray. Um, they realize that the Novus Ordo is still valid. There's a lot of problems with it, but it's still valid. But the opposite is not true. People who are virulently, uh, we might say, to the left in the church, um, will they won't touch the traditional mass with a 10-foot pole, at least, you know, on first reaction. Yeah, I was reading an article from America Magazine uh, by a Jesuit priest, uh, an older Jesuit priest who was... Um, he grew up with a Trinity mass and he was, his article was basically, oh yeah, I remember whenever I was growing up, I went to a, uh, I went to, so I wanted to try to see if I could still remember how the Trinity mass was. So I went to a Trinity mass for the first time and since my childhood and he writes about his experience and then he's like, yeah, it was terrible. Oh my gosh. I would never do, uh, have celebrated mass like this. And he kept on going, uh, railing against it. Um, and I'm like, you don't hear uh, people that are like, in love with the Trinity Mass, say I would never go to a Novus Ordo Mass. I, well, that's just you, not do. Me. Uh, you do, you um, do. Mm, not that they would never go to it, but that they really avoid it. Um, uh, but you're right; it's not that same kind of uh, with with people that you're talking about, like you're talking about. There's an idea that there's something inherently wrong, evil, with the Tridentine Mass. Um, that it's that it re represents a different religion, um, and 
I would argue that people on the other side of the spectrum, people who attend the traditional mass and who love it, don't. while they may avoid the Novus Ordo and, and, and go to the traditional mass more often, they don't have the same kind of uh, violent reaction to the Novus Ordo. Yeah. As the other way around. And so unless you're talking about like, you know, some um hard some people who are more hardcore like SSPXers or you know, obviously set of a contest, but they're another story. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about set of a contest. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, why, kinda, yeah. why don't uh, if you're done with me, why don't you go ahead and share your uh your experience first experience with tradition? Yeah, I will absolutely share my uh, faith experience with you. <laughs> um I had I actually don't have a problem with these buzzwords. I think they all have a they they have a meaning, and um, if we use them correctly, there's not a problem. I think it's just that they've been hijacked. If you're not if you're not sure what we're talking about, go watch Taylor Marshall's video on uh, Novus Ordo buzzwords. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's really it's quite funny. Okay, so my faith journey. Um, yeah, so I was uh, like I said last time. Um, I grew up in a kind of a live teen. Well, not kind of. It was a very live teen uh, experience where we had a clapping at mass. We had guitars and drums and it was super exciting. I loved it. I was so into it. Um, But you know, I realized, well, okay. Looking back, I realized, so I won't say that yet. Uh, So um, it was probably back when I was in. um, So my freshman year at the university of St. Thomas, I had a few people who would come up to me and tell me about like, Oh yeah. They talk about how they didn't, there's, they had problems with the mass, but they didn't like this out of the other. They didn't like this music at mass. They didn't like doing this at mass. And I was like, okay, whatever. He all rigid. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so I was a uh, super not into tradition, um, in the liturgical sense. I've always been theologically sound. Um, but liturgically speaking, I, I felt like that was wrong. Yeah. And you grew up praying the rosary. Yeah. I grew up that. praying the rosary every day. Yeah. Um, we grew up, I studied, uh, for some reason I was always really into, uh, reading the saints and things like that. So I never really read modern theology. It was all just reading lives of the saints and things like that, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, I never had that problem. I never, uh, and then I saw how people talked about the mass, um, and how the saints talked about the mass. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is what they mean. Um, but I didn't realize that the, the mass that I was attending, the mass that, uh, I grew up with is not the same mass that the saints grew up with. Not even, not even like modern saints, like mother Teresa. She exactly. was actually like, she was born in like 1920 or 1910. So she lived, grew up with the Latin mass. Yeah. John Paul II, he grew up with the Latin mass. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, Benedict the 16th, he grew up with the Latin mass, all, all these people. Um, and it like, looking back, I'm like, what on earth? Um, and so fast forwarding a little bit, uh, sophomore year, I took, uh, Latin, um, and well, just real quick, that's why the traditional mass is also called the mass of the saints because all, you know, uh, almost all the saints or the saints we have in the Western church, um, all grew up with that mass or some variation that's very close to it. Yeah, because now, then we have the East too, which they're a different story. But right, yeah, yeah, because uh, the Tridentine mass we call it the Tridentine because it's uh, typically we refer to it as coming from the Council of Trent. Right. Uh, but that's not exactly true. Um, the Tridentine mass existed before the Council of Trent. Um, in fact, it was uh, it's dated as early as around the three four hundreds. I've heard like sixth century. Right? Really, yeah, Gregory sixth century. The Great. Uh, see, I've heard that it's actually predates that. Okay. Um, well, there are various uses like the Galician, right. they're the, uh, Mozart, Mozarabic, the, uh, Ambrosian, which is still in use in Milan. Um, but it was codified by Pius V, St. Pius V in 1570. And so the, the traditional missile is also called the missile of Pius V, the missile of 1570. And it codified all these various uses, these various rites that were, um, that were in circulation around Europe. So, yeah. Anyway, so, so ahead. the, uh, so that's that, my point with that. It was that, um, the saints from like the early church all the way to 1960, whatever, 62, 67, um, 69, um, was the, those that was the mass of the saints. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but anyway, so, um, sophomore year, sophomore year. Yeah. Right. Uh, two things that happened sophomore year. 
One, I took a class with uh, my this professor, Dr. Rebard, um, who studied under Peter Kreeft. Um, and he uh, would start off class every day by praying um, the come Holy Spirit, but he would pray it in Latin. Um, and I was very intrigued by that. Um, and I would go talk to him after his class a lot of times to talk about different things uh, relating to metaphysics because um, that was the class we were taking. Um, he never did that with my class. Really? No. Wow. Well, he uh, would do that every every time. And uh, one time he invited me to go to the Latin Mass. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. I don't think I'll do that. Um, and so he kept inviting me every now and then. And Same with me, actually. Really? It was him that got me into it. Wow. Yeah. We should tell him that. Yeah, I don't uh, think he knows. Yeah, I don't think he knows either. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, so uh, <laughs> I finally went uh, one time. And it was a low mass. And I went and I was like, sitting there people <laughs> we were 15 minutes into mass until i realized that we had already started mass <laughs> i was like i was like what? I, understand. I was like what is the priest doing up there is he like setting up for mass i was trying to figure out what he was doing and i was so confused um and so then to pe- get a to get a visual perspective you should you guys should look up on youtube a video of a low mass so you can kind of understand what we're talking about or go to one. Very different. Or, or go to one. <laughs> oh, that works too. It's very different. Yeah. And, it, it's, and it's a lot of silence. Yeah. If you're your first time you go, it's definitely going to be a different experience and you're going to be very confused. Yeah. Very confused. Um, and, but it, that's okay. Just watch and pay attention. See watch what's going on. Let um, the mystery wash over you. Absolutely. And so I, uh, after a while, I realized that we were starting. Experience. Yeah, I know, right? Goodness. Um, and so I just started just copying uh, Dr. Rebard, who was sitting in front of me. Uh, so he was sitting there at mass. Um, and I was like, so, okay, I'll just do what he's doing. So I just started copying him. Um, and after mass was over, I was like, I will never <laughs> do this again. <laughs> I was like, this was the absolute worst thing ever. I was like, There's, it's confusing. I have no idea what's being said. Um, the things that I could hear, which everything was whispered, everything, things I could hear was in Latin. I didn't know Latin. And I was like, I could have, I was like, I have a, the missile here and I like can't even figure out where we're at in the missile. Uh, I was like, this is terrible. Um, and then me and you were talking about it after, one day after Latin class. Yeah, um, like three and, days. Yeah. A bunch of days. And... You were just talking about it. I was like, no, man, I'm, I'm not about that. Not about that life. Um, and you were like, oh, come on, Adrian. Oh. And I was like, no, no, I'm Max. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Um, and fast forward, um, I started going to um, mass at this church Annunciation. Um, Oldest Catholic church in use in Houston. Right. Uh, and it is uh, it's a beautiful church. Mm-hmm. If you ever come to Houston, you got to come visit. But the uh, I started going to the Latin um, the Latin Novus Ordo Mass uh, because uh, it was uh, the readings are in English, and I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll give it Latin a little bit of a try again. Which um, the the if you don't know the new Mass, the Mass of Paul the Sixth, um, the Novus Ordo can be celebrated in Latin. It, the typical form is in Latin. So really, it should be celebrated in Latin. So that's what he's talking about. Yeah. So the Mass is said in Latin, um, and it's really nice. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's just like the Novus Ordo Mass, because it is the Novus Ordo Mass, except that it's been translated to Latin. So I could follow along. I knew what was going on. Everything made sense to me. Um, and then one day, so I started discerning the priesthood. And one of my priests told me, uh, my vocation, the vocation director for the archdiocese was telling me, you need to uh, serve at mass. I was like, have you ever served at mass before? I was like, no, I haven't served at mass since I was like seven. And then I quit after day one. <laughs> and so they uh, contacted Father Paul, who was my uh, pastor at Annunciation. He uh, was like, okay, well, well uh, how about, how do you feel about uh, being trained in Latin mass? I was like, okay, cool. That's what mass I go to. Um, whenever he said that, <laughs> he was referring to the Tridentine Mass. Yep. When I said that, I was referring to the Latin Novus Ordo Mass. <laughs> so he's like, so we're talking, and then I, I basically signed up for it. And then he was like, okay, 8 a.m. And I was like, 8 a.m.? What? I, mass is at 11. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I started showing up, and I was like, okay, fine. Well, I already committed, so let's do this. And so he would have me sit in choir. And I started sitting in choir. And it was beautiful. Which means just sitting there and not doing anything. Right, right, right. But you're sitting, up in the sanctuary with a cassock and surplus. Yes. And so I just started sitting up there uh, for about two or three times. 
and it was absolutely gorgeous. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, and then I, I felt offended by the fact that I've never been seen this before. Now you were going, these were high masses, right? Yes. This was a high mass. Okay. Yeah. High mass meaning with singing and incense. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the great thing about it was I've always been attracted to Gregorian chant and things like that. Um, I used to like listen to it, um, and when I was doing homework and things like that, um, and then it also, I loved it because um, the, it's usually used in soundtracks of movies. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Or Halo. And, I'm, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, are you kidding me? We're, we, secular Wars. movies uses Gregorian Star Wars chance. has the Dies Irae in it. It's crazy. I, I was like, this is like, why, why are we using like Catholic, our Catholic why heritage in, gather in, us in secular in. movies? <laughs> why are we singing Gather Us In when we could be singing all this other stuff? It's, it's like secular movies understand yes. the, the, the gravitas of, yes. of the music and we, we want to sing Go Make a Difference. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and so finding out this uh, really moved me. Um, and so that was the, that's how I ended up where I'm at, where uh, now I serve at uh, the Trinity Mass every Sunday. Um, and now, and I actually serve now. I don't just sit there. Uh, so it's pretty cool. I love it. Um, so, okay. So there is a thing you wanted to talk about that came up. Um, there was a letter sent out, um, to a traditional priest in Australia. Well, before, before we get to that, um, we'll run a little short on time. Maybe I'd like to just point out one thing off of what you just said. Um, so, when Adrian was talking about a talking about how secular movies understand our Catholic heritage better than we do with the use of Gregorian chant and they recognize beauty. I mean, think about it when you look, when you watch a movie, um, they don't pick when they're trying to depict a Catholic church, they don't pick those churches in the round. Absolutely. That, yeah. That you see today, they pick, you know, the most beautiful ones like, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Um, in a similar way, there was, um, in the 60s, um, an association of writers who were not Catholic. I think some of them were, but oh, not all of exactly them. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. But not all of them were Catholic. Some of them, were, I think, were even atheists, but they were just writers and people about town who, who understood culture. And um, they wrote a letter to the Vatican asking them to restore the traditional Latin mass because of its value to it, because it was the mass that built Western civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the Christian Europe anyways. And um, they realized the value of it apart from, apart from faith. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And among them was Agatha Christie, um, an English, English writer, um, so that's something interesting that you all should check more about. Um, yes, yeah, so let's conclude with this instead. Um, we're talking about that because uh, that's a whole tangent we could talk yeah, about exactly, for like. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about for the next like ten minutes. Um, so I mean, if I if you don't mind, one other thing I wanted to mention was that not only is it, um, it's not just about the mass, right? right. So why does tradition appeal to the youth? Like it's not just the mass; it's everything that goes that. That follows that. So, um, like for instance, I was thinking, um, the idea, the longing that the youth have today, and which is the reason why we have so many people so, um, militant about politics and things like that, because people are looking for a common home, a vessel for culture, a common language, a college, a common, a common culture, a common tradition, and a common tr community. And they find that in, uh, politics, but that's not where it's supposed to be at. Right. They have to be. They're looking, we're looking to be grounded in something. And uh, because the world around us today is really very in, unstable with, you know, now even gender is a choice you make. Now, I mean, you can, there's just so many choices that, uh, that people are, they don't know it, but they're longing for solidity, solid they're looking for foundations, truth. right? Truth. Um, the capital T said that uh, truth is a very uh, limiting on your freedom because once you have truth, mm -hmm. you can no longer believe something that's false. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's like uh, his example he used is once you know the year that Shakespeare was born and died, you can no longer believe that he was born and died at a different date. Um, exactly. Yeah. So the truth is limiting. Exactly. Uh, so it's really simple. Um, and, 
But as we were saying, it's not just about the mass. It starts with the mass because the mass is the the church's most public form of prayer um, as Sacrosanctum Concilium Vatican II document says. And now we'll get into that later. It wasn't necessarily Vatican II that messed things up, but it was the so-called spirit of Vatican II. Which doesn't exist. Which which is dead <laughs> now, right? Um, but the, the mass is the source and summit of our faith, and it uh, it's the most public form of prayer. So that's where everything sort of flows from. And the liturgy generally, the, the work of the church um, flows from and it finds its fulfillment in the liturgy. including So that includes all seven sacraments plus the liturgy, the hours, but most fully in the Eucharist. Um, but things I'm, th- other you know, other sort of ways of life that I'm thinking of that that uh, the traditional Catholicism engenders is, for example, um, not eating meat on any Friday ever. Right. Yeah. Not I started just doing during that. Lent. I started doing that. Me and, too. Yeah. And it's uh, it's it's difficult, but it's liberating because it is difficult. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Because I was looking at stats, and it's and it was looking at how there's a, a huge swath of people converting to Islam, and the reason why they're converting to Islam is because they uh, find it hardcore. Because it's hardcore. Because it requires something of you. Yeah, it's asking it doesn't cater a lot. to you. And, and that's what traditional Catholicism does. And the funny thing was the Catholic Church used to uh, call um, the Muslim fast uh, weak because uh, our right. fast was way more intense. Right. Who was that? Was it one of the church fathers? Yeah, it was. Like uh, John Cassian or something? It wasn't one of the church fathers, but it was one no. of the um, uh, one of the early saints because uh, the church fathers pretty much were all dead by the time Islam oh, rose. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, St. John Stupid. Damascus was the last church father that yeah, was alive yeah. uh, no, during no, that time that, period. That would forget I ever said that. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So it's crazy. The um, so yeah. But our the the patrimony that we have um, is well, it's still on the canon law. It's, it has never been abrogated. Yeah. So actually, we fast every Friday. Well, I mean, the, fast, the new code abstain. of canon law says abstain from meat or um, impl- use another penitential practice. An equal. Penitential oh, yeah. Right. Practice. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and praying one rosary is not equal. I don't think. No. Uh, and you should so, be doing that every day. Maybe if you decided to fast completely instead, um, maybe that would be sure. Equal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, depending on what the fast is. <laughs> but the point is that the purpose of not eating meat on Fridays is to commemorate the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And why? Why? Someone tell me who thought it was a good idea to take that off the books, yeah, or to to discourage that, right? Yeah, because um, the Thomas Aquinas did a treatise explaining uh, why meat, and it, he was talking about why how no meat, right? yeah, why, why no meat, why not no fish, or why not why no nice meals? Yeah. Um, because like there, his the point was being made that oh, what if you live in a place where um, meat really doesn't you don't really eat a lot of meat? It's more like a fish thing. Right. Or what if you'd like to go get lobster? It's like okay, well, I mean. You're you're not fulfilling the spirit of the um, of the requirement. That's but... why I kind of have an issue with fish fries <laughs> because yeah. Lenten fish fries. Because okay, we're having this big meal. I mean, of good food, and that defeats the purpose of. So I so this is this what I was my point was going to be. It was that the uh, this you were violating the spirit of the the abs, abstination absta, abstinence, abstinence right and um but. Even if you violate the spirit of it, the fact that you're following the letter of the law is actually more important because the fact that we give up meat is referring to the meat of Christ, the flesh of Christ that was crucified for us on Good Friday. Sure. And we're commemorating that. So even if you violate the spirit of um, of it um, by going at least the very legalistic of no meat, um, you are still recognizing that reality. You are. And that, that is a good thing. But it's it's not an either or. I think it should be. I think it's both that you can't eat no meat and then have like a seafood fest, right? Yeah. Because, and gorge yourself. So, um, well, what's another thing? I can, one, one thing I can think of is um, the rosary. Um, now, I know you said you grew up praying it, but I didn't learn how to pray the rosary till I was like in seventh grade. Really? Yeah. And I know a bunch of Catholics who, uh, like Dr. Edward Sri, for example, do you know him? Yeah. From um, the Augustine it's, Institute. Yeah, Augustine Institute, that's right. He tells a story um, where, this is, I guess in the late 90s, uh, he I think he was a convert, I could be wrong. But he went into, he was coming home from work, went to a church and started praying a rosary. 
And the lady walked up to him and said, oh, don't you know Father said we don't do that anymore? That old what? superstition? Yeah. That's crazy. And and uh, I know many people who, who think it, and I even grew up with that with that prejudice thinking like, well, what the heck is this? This is this is strange. That's and, absurd. Right. So I really felt uh robbed by, you know, not not growing up praying that. But now I love it. Yeah, my my in my community, the because I grew up at a uh very a Mexican parish. Uh we had like two English masses. And a Catholic um, community. Yeah, we had a Catholic community. <laughs> Actually, we didn't call ourselves a Catholic community, which was one good thing. Uh but um the but now it's called Catholic community. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, no, no, no. Uh, you're referring to St. Saint, Saint, oh, yeah, 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 different okay. church. Okay. I was at a different okay, church you. at that time. Okay. Yeah. And so the, uh, now they had, um, the, it was, they had like two English masses. And so we would only go to the English mass cause that's, I don't, I we only know English. My parents know Spanish, but I, I don't, and my, my siblings don't. Um, and so the, but everybody there were Mexican, Hispanic. Uh, we had a, that common heritage. Um, and part of that common heritage was Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so having the rosary was just a part of life. Yeah. And so the fact that someone could grow up in the Catholic church and not have that, that's absurd. Um, yeah. I think Father Don Calloway is the one who said, Oh yeah. Um, since one. the rosary has been given to St. Dominic, there has not been a saint who has not prayed the rosary daily. Yep. Yeah. That's right. So that's, that's what, absurd. What's another thing? Um, think of? Holidays. Holidays such as holidays meaning uh holy days. Oh, you um, mean like um observance of the calendar? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's completely been like disregarded. Like we we follow secular calendars completely. Like we don't even acknowledge right. uh and like we what do we do? We celebrate Saint Patrick's Day by engorging ourselves with alcohol and green beer. Um, we have we uh celebrate Mardi Gras by having uh crazy parades and um yeah. sexual license. Uh, we, we, we completely disregard all these Catholic holidays, Halloween. What do um, we do with Halloween? Right. Well, right. Or even like, um, I think an observance of the liturgical calendar. Most people don't follow it, you know? Oh yeah. Like sept, sect two, sept, what is it? Well, like uh, a day to day, day to day, um, life. But yeah, so you were about to talk about Septuagesima, which is, <coughs> excuse me, sept meaning 70. Um, and, uh, uh, so Lent in Latin is called quadragesima because it's 40 days before Easter. Um, well set in the old calendar in, in the East in all the Eastern churches, as far as I know, there's a season called septuagesima, which is pre Lent. So it starts 70 days before Easter. So it's a prep time of preparation for Lent. But for some reason that was taken out in the old calendar. Someone tell me why. I don't know. It, there's no good reason. Um, but even like just a common people, you know, observing days like, well, we just celebrated the Annunciation. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, on March 25th. And then a week before that, St. Joseph, March 19th. Um, like these, these feast days, these solemnities, um, how amazing would it be if we built a community around these feast days and had a, our, our heritage celebrated? Right. Um, because it gives us a common language, a common culture, um, customs, a community. Um, that that's what we long for as uh, as youth and as just human beings. Communion with God. That's the main thing we long for. Exactly. And yes. Yeah, uh, Augustine. We have a a God shaped hole in our heart. Um, yep. So the yeah, and I think tradition is really a, a longing is a longing for God because we have washed out God from um the the from the church right when we go to mass like i said it's not just the mass but it starts with the mass when we go to mass it should be different from mm-hmm. daily life so it's that's why it doesn't work to play pop music pop style music in mass that's why people like that i i think i would argue who grow up on life teen and don't ever experience anything else. I would, I think they leave the church because they realize, well, how is this any different than, you know, everyday life? Um, or when you have a priest who, uh, thinks who takes it upon himself to turn the mass into his own monologue where he just, it makes up stuff on the whim, Mm -hmm. like as if it's a lecture or a class, right? We don't want more of that. Yeah. We want something different. And the externals, including, you know, the music, um, the liturgical vestments, the statuary, 
uh, that all has an effect on on our experience of the liturgy. Um, and it's catechetical. It teaches us that, whoa, there's something different going on here. This is not just uh, another random hour out of my week. This is the most important hour of my week. Um, and the priesthood is one thing I want to talk about too. Um, I think that, yes, exactly, you said transcendent. Um, what we've seen in the last 50 years is a real attack on the priesthood. Absolutely. You can see that in priests who don't wear their clerics, um, who uh, who often say, well, you know, I'm just a regular guy. Mm-hmm. I'm just, just like you, you lady. Except and, he's not like us. Right. He has an indelible mark on his soul. He's right. ontologically changed, different. Exactly. And they use that as an excuse to not hold themselves to a higher standard. And yes, it, 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 they're not perfect because they are priests. In fact, I think it's harder to be moral as a priest. But the point is that they are held to a higher standard because they are a minister of the mysteries of God. Um, and speaking of mysteries, uh, the mystery of the faith was something that was also eschewed. So the traditional Latin mass with many things, the, the Latin language, silence, um, and the, the priest facing east, uh, so what people some people characterize as facing away from the people, but mm-hmm. what I characterize as facing the, pe- toward facing God. the same direction towards God, preserve the mystery. Leading the people in prayer. Exactly. Instead of talking to the people. All those things preserve the mystery mm-hmm. of the faith that is so paramount. And that, that in the, the, the Novus Ordo kind of, well, here it is, and we're going to give you the bare bones so you know exactly what's going on. Well, what I was telling you before we started recording was how like um, this watered down Catholicism that we got as a youth, um, we that was an inoculation to authentic Catholicism. Um, Explain. Yeah. So whenever we get this watered down faith, it's kind of like a vaccine. You get a vaccine. It's like uh, I'm not a biologist by any means. uh, But from my understanding, it's a weakened version of the virus. So whenever you get injected to your body your white blood cells get stronger in order and learn how to defend itself against that uh, virus. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, giving us a watered down Catholicism, this happy clappy uh, stuff. Um, that doesn't challenge us. It doesn't challenge us at all. Yeah. In fact, uh, you talk to most former Catholics and they'll say, oh yeah, I went to Catholic school my whole life. Oh yeah, I got, uh, I went to faith formation my whole life. I went to mass every Sunday. Um, and then they left the faith. Why? And then nothing can convince them otherwise. The reason why that nothing can convince them otherwise is because they think they understand it. They think they have the fullness of it and reject it, but they don't. They don't have the fullness of it and they haven't rejected authentic Catholicism. They have rejected um, this brand of Catholicism, this watered down Catholicism. That's what they have rejected. Um, And so they're inoculated to authentic Catholicism with this watered down version of it. Because what they got was in for all practical purposes, except for the validity of the sacrament, Protestantism. Yeah, absolutely. We've built our churches like Protestant churches. There's an idea that that uh, something went wrong uh, before Vatican II, and we had to restart everything and uh, be more like the Protestants. That's, I mean, at Vatican II, they had six Protestant theologians helping to create the Novus Ordo. Really, and I heard also that in the first edition of the Novus Ordo, which was engineered by Bunini and Abale Bunini, there were no signs of the cross, and really? two thirds of the cardinals in the Sistine Chapel got up and left. They said, "This is not Catholic." Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. I so, didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. It's, you know, it's it's better, especially with the new translation we have since 2010. But, but, uh, man, pray that traditional mass. Right. We, yeah, absolutely. We got to go. Yeah, pray but, the rosary every day. Pray the rosary um, every day. Um, but again, just remember, it's not just about the mass. It's about an entire way of life that orders you towards God. All right, so let's conclude uh, in prayer. But real quick, uh, next week, I want to go over the uh, post-synodal uh, apostolic exhortation by Pope Francis on the youth. On the youth. Yep. Uh, so we're going to read it over the next week, and then we'll talk about it next week. Sounds good. Um, all right, so let's let's, uh, let's teach our listeners the sign of the cross in Latin. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's in nomine, in nomine patris et filii et, et spiritus sancti. Amen. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace. The, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In nomine. In nomine Patris, Filii, Spiritus Sancti. St. Vincent Ferrer, pray for us. Amen.